Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special Roosh Hour, Roosh Hour number 37. I am very excited to have with me a special guest, a man that I'm very humbled by because he innately knew something that took me 15 years to learn on my own. So today I have Dr. E. Michael Jones. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Roosh. And I don't know how much uh, of my arc you know, but I'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, back when I was 21, I discovered the pickup community. Uh, at first, I wanted a girlfriend, but it was actually easier just to engage in casual sex with a lot of women. It turned into the default mode. And for many years, I pursued this in addition to writing many books and manuals that glorified this, that uh, instructed other men to do it too, until I hit a dead end, until I could no longer increase the happiness or the pleasure I received from doing that. And this started in 2015, about 14, 15 years after I started. And uh, one thing that the culture, it tends to tell us that we are like, animals, that we are like monkeys and dolphins, uh, that if we get the sexual urge, we should just pursue it. We should try to satisfy it. Uh, sex is everywhere in the culture. There's nothing wrong, they say, with just uh, you know chasing after the lust that you have. So I guess the first question for you, Dr. Jones, is aren't we just like the animals? Aren't we just like the monkeys with the sex drive that we should chase after? Uh, yes, we are, uh, but there's a difference. Uh, the animals uh, act according to instinct. Animals have no choice when it comes to sexual behavior. Uh, there's something called estrus in dogs. There's a, a, a cycle where suddenly the female is ready. To, it goes into heat, and uh, the dogs have have sex. Have sex. Uh, fish. A uh, salmon, suddenly an electrochemical reaction goes off. They turn around, they swim back upstream, they lay the eggs, they fertilize the eggs, and they die. So the animals have no choice in this matter. Uh, the difference with human beings is that we have uh, logos. So in other words, we have a soul that has three parts to it. Basically, there's uh, logos, ethos, and pathos. There's logos, which is reason. There's will in the middle, and there's appetite at the bottom. And the whole point of a happy life is making sure that uh, the bottom part conforms to the top part. So the Greeks uh, had imagery, uh, used imagery of like the horse and the rider. Uh, if you've ever ridden a horse and you don't know what you're doing, it can be a terrifying experience because the horse will take you where it wants to go and you can kill yourself. But if you have the, the reins uh, in your hand and you control the horse, it's, it's a happy experience for both the animal and the man. And that's the same thing with uh, appetite. The whole point of appetite, the whole point of a successful life is to conform appetite to reason. You do that because you're dealing with another person and that other person's destiny uh, becomes then part of your destiny. And so I'm, ju I'm just reading uh, Hegel and uh, his whole sense of the, uh, the triad, the, uh, the dialectic, uh, is in a sense uh, sexual. Uh, you, the, you, you are attracted to the other. Attraction means a desire for union. You have this sexual union, uh, and in that sexual union, you, you confirm the other's existence, and the other confirms your existence, and out of this existence comes another person. And that becomes the synthesis of the in this dialectic. And that is the dialectic that is part of, of human history at its most basic level, at, at the cellular level, if you want to talk about that. And that cellular level is known as the family. And that's what makes us all. That's where we all come from. Now, over the course of uh, the, the uh, what would I say, what should I say, human development, we came to a period called the Enlightenment. And suddenly these forces were subjected to a type of mechanical mechanistic, scientific, materialistic scrutiny. And at this point, the people realized uh, that we were taught, we're looking into it, realized that there was a power here that could be harnessed and used as a form of control by turning it upside down. 
which is exactly what happened. A revolution is turning things upside down. And so if you turn this upside down and you put passion on the top and reason on the bottom, this has always been a possibility. Okay, someone like Shakespeare would say something to the effect of, give me that man who is not slave's passion. So people always knew that if you let these appetites get out of control, you would become a slave. Uh, St. Augustine said, a man, a rich man, though, uh, uh, though a king is a slave, and uh, uh, the moral man, though uh, a slave, is, uh, is a king because he controls himself. And uh, a man has as many masters as he has appetites. That was the ancient wisdom. It got turned upside down. So Augustine said, well, if you want to be free, control your passions. And the people like the Marquis de Sade and Wilhelm Reich and all these people you read about in, in La Vida Dominante said, well, if you want to control people, unleash the passions. And that was basically the insight that led me to write the book uh, uh, Libido Dominandi. Because I, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm older than you. I grew up as a guinea pig in this experiment. I was there at high noon of the sexual uh, revolution in America, which was the 60s. Uh, I watched. Uh, I was fortunate in, in escaping it because I, I got married when I was 21 years old and that kept me on the straight and narrow. My wife was 20 and we escaped. I, I sort of watched it as a bystander. You know, I could see, I could see the collateral damage. I could see the, the bombs going off. I could see people dropping to the right and to the left, but I, I was uh, saved from it because I, I, I stuck with my marriage. And because of that, I think I was able to understand it. And that's what led me to, to, to do that book. When I read your book, Libido Dominandi, which I urge for every man to read, one thing that got me is that you knew what took experience for me to learn. And the thing is, you kept mentioning in that book that experience can be very costly. And it was very costly for me in the fact that I donated the prime of my years into figuring things out that men like you n knew. And a man watching right now can say, well, the things that Dr. Jones says is very good, but there's, why isn't there anything in the culture, any of the messages being delivered to me that match that? In fact, like you mentioned, it's inverted. Everything is the opposite. Everything is trying to sate that lust that you have. So how did we get from w where things were? to the current year, 2019. And it seems like every level, every institution is trying to suck men and w women into this lustful game of trying to satisfy their passions. Yes, you're right. That's why you don't hear anybody talk about it because uh, you're not supposed to know what I just told you. You're supposed to be a good, docile sex robot wage slave and engage in, uh, as I said in another book, uh, transient, sterile relationships, because that's the best way the oligarch can, can strip you of your labor and turn you into their slave. They know that, they understand it completely, and that's why they'll never talk about it. And so uh, I, you're right. I mean, Ben Franklin said, experience keeps an expensive school, but fools will learn in no other. So Better to learn in the expensive school than not to learn at all. And if your if your if your audience is men, I mean, yeah, it, you have an advantage because you have uh, a, a longer what should I say a longer procreative career than women, and and you have chance to and a chance to make up for it uh, in in lots of ways that women don't. I just had a conversation uh, with a woman who contacted me through the internet, hadn't read anything that I've written. And she was exactly the epitome of every every one, every book I wrote, okay? So she starts off in, in Boston. She's living on a street in Boston where every single person on the street is an Irish Catholic. And everybody takes care of everybody else. And she has this nostalgia for this place. And they get destroyed by ethnic cleansing. The blacks get moved in, become the proxy war of the oligarch to drive this person out. 
drive everyone out. They go to the suburbs and they are completely deracinated and cut off. And when you're lonely and you're subjected, what, what happens in the suburbs? You're not uh, sitting on the front step playing with your neighbors or talking to your neighbors. You're watching television. You're driving a car. You're isolated. When you feel isolated, you feel lonely. When you feel lonely, you have this kind of uh, sexual desire that you don't have otherwise. And, and she succumbs to it. And uh, in her 20s, early 20s, she goes to total full hog, whole hog, sexual liberation, uh, five years, numerous sex partners, three abortions later, she's wrecked. She's damaged. At that point, she becomes a lesbian. What, what I find for 14 years, she lived in a lesbian relationship and now it's because she hates men. I mean, I, so the first book is Slaughter of Cities. That's described as destruction of a neighborhood. Second book is uh, Libido Dominandi, which strikes out how she was sexually engineered and so on and so forth. That's 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 the way it works. And so what the, the good news is that she woke up and she said, ah, I finally realized what happened to me. The bad news is I only have one life. I only you know, have one life. And I can't have children anymore. And what am I going to do now? I'm 50 some years old. What I find the most unfair, what they're, what the culture is doing, what the oligarchs are doing to women is putting them on the same educational and career timeline as m men. So starting when they're 18, they go to university for four years or more. Then they're really encouraged to establish themselves, to get a career, to get that middle management job, and to not worry about uh, creating a family until their income is high enough to enjoy first class amenities in the urban right. en environment. But the time she is established, and during those years she's doing that, she spent all those years focused on career, not on a man that she could love and have a family with. She wakes up on the, on the at 28, 29, and now time is running out. Now I'm 39. Um, you know, there is still hope for me, let's say. But if a woman went on the same trajectory as me, at 39, there's no options. So do you think that they are targeting women a little bit harder than men because they know that women have this shorter fertility time span? Well, I think that basically you're talking about feminism now and the fe feminism came into uh, prominence in the 70s. And I think the main reason it did was because they were the great untapped labor resource at that point. The, the Rockefellers, the big foundations, the oligarchs at that point were interested in driving wages down. The simplest way to drive wages down is to double the workforce, and you double the workforce by bringing women in. And so that's why there was this big push to convince women to get to have uh, careers. Now, this was not just the United States. I mean, one of the great ironies is this happened in Iran. I've been over in Iran numerous times. You know, I preached in a mosque in Iran. Uh, and I, I was there in the mosque. I gave the, the, the libido dominandi talk in the mosque. And, the, you know, all the guys are sitting there on the rugs and all the women are in the room in the back and they're all listening to me. And I said to the guys, how many of you guys are married? About 20 guys raised their hand. Then I went down the line. How many children do you have? Zero, zero, zero. Not one married man had one child. And this is Iran that basically came into, I mean, you're, you're probably a product of this, but I mean, the, the, the Islamic revolution was a repudiation of the great Satan, of American materialism. The Shah was too much involved in the sexualization of Iran. They, they threw it off, and then here the same system comes back again. How did this happen? How did this happen? How did you create a nation of feminists in Iran? Well, feminine, uh, education was part of it. And all of these women, all these poor women have spent all their time becoming nuclear physicists. And now they're wondering, when am I going to have a family? You know, it's not fair to these women. My, 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 my son, the, uh, my youngest son is a, uh, in, in ballet. He goes to the Cincinnati Ballet, uh, gets a job there. He meets a woman. They fall in love. They get married. Uh, they invite everyone to the wedding. Okay. Well, this was a, tr a tremendous bre breach of protocol.
because especially in the arts, especially when you're in something ballet, you're supposed to be a good soldier in the sexual revolution and engage, as I said, in transient, sterile relationships. In other words, you're supposed to act like a homosexual, even if you're not a homosexual. And, and uh, so, th so the, the retaliation, the boss, the big boss at the ballet retaliates by firing my son and promoting my daughter-in-law. Now, if this is an assault on marriage, I don't know what is. And she retaliated by having a child. And she inspired all these other ballerinas to get, engage in an insurrection against the, the gay lifestyle, even when you're a heterosexual. And the best way to prove that you're not a heterosexual, I guess, is to have a child. So four children were born out of this insurrection against this inhuman regime that has been imposed on everyone, but, but especially on women for the reasons that you mentioned. You know, I have long said that dating actually originated with the gays in the 1920s. Gays couldn't go out. They couldn't hold hands with other men. So they would meet in these dark rooms late at night that served alcohol. And then after the alcohol was done, either they would engage in some activity there in, in the bathrooms there, or they would go nearby to a room, a private room. And that's what heterosexuals do now. So when you talk about sterile relationships, that's we're doing what the gays used to do. And it's no surprise that, like you mentioned, when you were in the mosque, no one is having kids, even if they are married. Here's a fun a fun fact. My grandfather, Iranian grandfather, he was a landowner. He had the maximum four wives and 26 kids. And my dad was one of those 26. He was the only one to leave the to leave the country. And he came to the United States and he had four kids. And me, I'm 39. I have zero kids. So you yeah, can well, see we're, how we're the generations are. Here, you know, <laughs> but as I said, you 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 have an advantage in that it's still a possibility for you, you know. Uh, but uh, that's the problem with women. They have a very they have a, a definite window of opportunity, and after that, it 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 doesn't work, you know. So, what do you think right now are the main ins institutions or techniques that the oligarchs are pushing to draw men? Uh, like me, away from just the impulse, the instinct of creating a family and into this satisfying your lust urge and f fornicating like a rock star? Is it, do you see specific uh, methods that are the most damaging? Um, education. Education is terrible. Educate, especially for the generation just under yours. Uh, uh, talking about the 20, the 20 year olds, 20 year olds are in a terrible situation, a terrible situation because of education and pro because of education debt. Debt is the main thing prohibiting marriage among 20 year olds, as far as I can tell, just from talking, talking to people. OK, this is this was the thing that was driving Occup Occupy Wall Street. I was there. I walked a crowd, virtually every guy was in his 20s and he's holding a little card saying, I'm $50,000 in debt and all I can get is an unpaid internship. This is a terrible situation. This is a betrayal of their entire generation. And the, 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 the result is uh, either, they're being pushed in one of two directions, uh, pushed toward homosexuality because that enslaves you even more. Uh, it, we have I, I have the 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 uh, um, the distinguished uh, uh, the 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 honor. Let's put it this way: of having the the most uh, the most famous gay mayor in America, uh, in South Bend, Indiana. His name is Pete Buttigieg. And if you ever wanted to understand the role the uh, the homosexuals play in being the proxy warriors of the oligarchs, look at Pete Buttigieg. He has created South Bend now, which was a family type of city, an ethnic type of city, a Catholic city. And he's trying to re-engineer it into basically the uh, the homosexual haven. It's like Berlin on the St. Joe River in Indiana. Berlin uh, pro pioneered this with these narcissistic fantasies of like, you don't ask for a job. You're the next Steve Jobs. 
You can have a startup. Well, even Spiegel, not a magazine I admire, said that startup is another word for low wages. This is all. So why are homosexuals so, so desirable? Well, because they don't have families and they don't have children. And so therefore, uh, they're easy to, to buy off when it comes to wage time and basically say, uh, sorry, we're not going to give you a raise, but you can always go to the gay disco and dance away your troubles. This is this is a t and they they so you you talk to this generation, and they for the most part they don't understand anything. So either they're being they're homosexuals, they're they're heading off to the gay disco because they don't have a job, or they're in the their mother's basement, they're watching pornography, which is another vicious trap, another vicious trap that people are just uh, people of their generation are just starting to wake up to. I talked to a twenty year old. Just the other day, he said, we're the generation that grew up on pornography because we have these little phones, you know, and we can access it instantly. And they know firsthand, as I said, we said before, in the expensive school of experience, you know you're a slave. And in a sense, that's a good thing. If you know you're a slave, then you know that you're missing something and maybe you need to know, take steps to attain your freedom by getting rid of the things that enslave you. So that's the way I see this uh, in terms of men you know a lot of men that i've talked to say that this free pornography which they have high production high definition these are three of the top 10 websites in the united states are porn websites uh, i don't think that is an accident i think that it's very available it's like a soma that keeps men in, that when they get that impulse on board they just load up a porn site and they play right. with themselves. And, um, you know, a lot of men through this experience and through they have noticed that the agenda within the porn, what they're pushing within the porn, these sites are starting to recommend incest. They're saying this is the sister brother sleeping with each other. So this is when men started to wake up. Wait a second. They're using porn as just another method to corrupt me in addition when you watch the porn then you see the women outside who are trying to mimic that too so what can we do about that i mean is there's how how much can men block out when online and offline uh sexualized images sexualized women are trying to keep their mind in the sexual realm i think it's possible there, there was a time when I thought that this was so powerful that no one's going to break the habit. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it's possible. I think in, in, in a sense it wears off. I think it wears off. The, and I think a sign that it's wearing off is that it's free. Why should this be free? Why is anything free? Huh. Well, because it's, it's the government wants to promote it because it's a form of control. Once you understand that, then I think you're on your way to, to, to freedom. Now, I am not trying to minimize the vicious nature of bad habits, okay? They are vicious. They, they, it's, it, they are very difficult to break. I'm just saying that it's possible. And I'm also not trying to say that uh, I have some type of magic pill. Uh, I don't have a magic pill. I, I, I believe in a re, uh, supernatural help. I'm a Catholic. I believe in that religion. I believe that that religion was created to give you assistance, to get you out of situations you cannot get out of on your own. That's known as grace. And I think that's why the Catholic Church is there. So I'm not going to, to, to pretend that I have the magic pill and I can sell it to you. I don't. But I think you can find some type of spiritual help to get out of these problems. And also, there are people in the church who are providing so, uh, programs, software, whatever you want to call it, that will help you break this habit. But the main, the main issue here is isolation. The pornography leads to isolation, and you need to seek companionship as the antidote to isolation. And I know that's difficult now. It's difficult now because of the situation, but that's the direction you have to go. I wanted to read something that you wrote in Libido Dominandi, because it really, I, I knew that sex was starting to draw my attention towards something, but I, it, it took me a while to connect how it's being used to actually control everyone. And you wrote, quote, 
once man is freed from the moral order, he is immediately subjected to the despotism of those who know how to manipulate his desires, and, and, end quote. So how does being fixated on sex as a man, how, how does it help the oligarchs maintain their own power? Well, lust, uh, lust darkens the mind. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas would say. We are rational creatures. And so we are distinguished by our mind and our ability to think. Um, you can't resist uh, an opponent when you're blind. The, if you look at the cover of the book, that's a portrayal of Samson. Samson uh, was the hero. He was the strongest uh, uh, warrior that the Israelites had. Uh, and uh, the Philistines couldn't beat him uh, because he was so powerful, but uh, he had couldn't control his passions. And because he couldn't control his passions, he ended up blind. It's like a physical representation of what Aquinas would say a thousand years later. They literally, she cut out his eyes, okay? That's what you are when you're the slave of your passions. Well, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to know where you're going if you're blind? This is, this is the most graphic instance I can give you of this or anyone. It's from the beginning of Libido Dominandi. It's the Israelis pull into Ramallah. And as soon as they take over Ramallah, they start broadcasting pornography over Palestinian TV stations. Now, why did they do this? I mean, the, the standard American explanation is that pornography is freedom. No one's free unless Larry Flint can produce pornography. So the, the Israelis are bringing freedom to the Palestinians. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? It proves that pornography is a weapon. If, if I ever needed proof, that's it. And, and there are people, you know, I, I've given this talk in Europe. I've given this talk, uh, you know, various places, the United States and Washington. And uh, times I've given it, there have been Palestinians in the audience. They come up and tell me, yeah, that happened. And it was worse than you said. It was worse than you said because there were snipers on the building, and if you went out, the snipers would shoot you. So that's, it's, I mean, so that that that's what we're talking about here, you know. I mean, you're blind. How, how, you know, it takes skill to negotiate life. You know, you have to. There's sometimes you want to start something, you want to do a business, you got to take risks, you got to make the right decisions. All of this stuff will be affected if you're addicted to pornography and lust is darkening your mind, you will not have a successful life. It's that simple. I experienced my sexual peak in 2011 and 12. I was in Europe going to the nightclubs. I was finding girls who wanted to have fun in the same way that I did. And during this time, I had many girls in, in my bed. I was, I felt like I was reaching some kind of peak, some kind of physical enlightenment. Now, if I encountered your work at that time, I would have said, oh, Dr. Jones, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This is everything. Bringing girls home that don't care about me and who I don't care about to rub up against each other for a short time and then go our separate ways. This is the peak of a male existence. Of course, that was wrong. I mean, you can't, you start to hit a dead end where you can't achieve that high of the girl you brought home a year ago. So what can you say to a man who is at that peak, a man like me in 2011, 12, who is experiencing what he thinks is the pleasure of the, of the flesh? Is there any way you can throw cold water on him? Is there any argument you can use to wake him up? Yeah, I think uh, God had a plan for your life. And God's plan for your life was different than my life. I mean, I did I never I didn't do that. Okay. So in a sense, I can't talk from experience here. You know what I mean? This is not the, the, the fantasy that you lived is not uh, something new. I, I, I don't know whether you've ever seen Don Giovanni, uh, but uh, there's a, an aria in there where one of the lines is a, a nella Spagna mille e tre. In, in Spain, there were a thousand and three women. You know what I mean? So you you were the one that got to live that uh, actual that fantasy out because God wanted you to understand it in a particularly existential way. It was bad what you did. It, it was evil what you did. But the whole point of human history is God taking evil and turning it into good. 
And he can do that in your life in a different, obviously he did it in your life in a way that was different than he did it in my life. But the two of us, between the two of us, I think we can come together and we come to some type of conclusion. You from one perspective and me from the other. That's the way I would see it. One thing that I read is that God gives you a specific vice that could be different than others. And he wants you to overcome that vice in order to get closer to him. So I think God gave me a lustful vice and the pride too, the pride to share that, oh guys, I'm traveling and sleeping around and I'm feeling my ego is growing. So he gave me these very two strong vices and through overcoming them, and I believe I'm in the process of, it's actually put me closer to him. So you may be right in that this is the specific journey for me. And unlike, say, you, who was placed on a different journey. Right. You can speak with conviction about your experience in a way that I cannot. I can't talk about that. That was not my life. You know, my life was completely different. You would not be the first person who had to overcome lust in order to come closer to God. St. Augustine uh, had a ver something very similar in, in his life and talked about it in, in his uh, confessions. It's one of the greatest books of, of Western literature. So uh, I'm saying that there is a big picture here and that, that even that is part of the big picture because this is the way God works in history. He takes evil and he turns it into good. That is the whole point of human history. And how he does it in your life is different than the way he did it in my life, you know. But I remember I remember those days, I mean, uh, back in, it was Germany for me, you know. And I, I arrive in Germany at the high noon of the sexual revolution. It's the 70s. I've, I've, I've tried to write, I've written about this, when everybody's going crazy. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? You know, I've never experienced anything like this. And the fact that I'm married and have a child saved my ass from a lot of trouble. You know, that's why I look back at now. And yet I still had this kind of nostalgia uh, for that period. So I, I wrote a novel about it, about what could have happened, you know, with me uh, in the Bader Meinhof gang. The novel's called The Rat Catcher. But I, I, I keep going back to that experience. Why am I here? Well, you're here because you need to understand something. And if I had succumbed to those temptations, maybe I never would have understood it. That's the other side of the coin that we could talk about. You know, maybe you were destined uh, to do something like that and you fucked it up because you couldn't control your passions. That's a possibility, too, you know, because I've gone back to it again. I was back in uh, and I gave a speech in, in Germany in October and I'm in uh, in Munich and I'm climbing the mountains. And I'm talking to this guy who's also kind of recovering from the same thing you're recovering from. And suddenly wakes up to the fact that, hey, we're all slaves here in Germany. Germany is one big concentration camp now, and we're all slaves. And how did this happen? Well, it didn't happen all by itself. And so that allowed me to go back and examine that period before I got there. The whole uh, social engineering of Germany that took place uh, beginning immediately after the Second World War, the conquered people who were basically subjected to a, a total, a full frontal assault on their sexual morality by the occupying powers. Every single magazine, book, uh, TV show, movie had to get a license from a Jewish psychiatrist from New York City who used all of those licenses to basically corrupt the morals of the, of the, of the German people. And I arrived at the tail end of that. That has had horrendous consequences for the Catholic Church throughout the world. The Pope, Pope Benedict the, the 16th just wrote an article about what really happened and how this homosexual mafia came to power in the Catholic Church. And he traced it back to the sexual revolution as he understood it in Regensburg in 1970. He's missing the point here. It was 25 years old by the time of 1970. You know, we have to talk about that that, that whole thing. I'm just saying that my experience in Germany, uh, again, I'm coming back to that same experience, understanding the depth and magnitude 
of what happened to an entire group of people, namely the Germans. I don't know whether he had much experience in Germany, but I mean, I have had a lot of experience in Germany. And I have a, 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 you can't understand the situation now unless you understand the sexual revolution that destroyed that people as independent uh, thinking group of people. Now, a lot of the people behind the sexual revolution say this is about individual freedom. This is about humans being free, um, pursuing their instincts and so on. But do you see this more as a spiritual war in the sense of the people who are pushing this are specifically against God and doing this in a way to turn people away from him? Yeah, you could, uh, you, like the, the whole chapter on Wilhelm Reich in uh, Libido Dominandi is, is an example of this. That's just one person, very influential person, but he was a, a communist, he, he was a Jew, he was a, a, a psychiatrist, all at the same time in Vienna during a crucial period during the 1930s when the communists were trying to take over the country. And he understood that I, I can't get anywhere talking to seminarians. He said, don't debate the existence of God with a seminarian, you'll get nowhere. But if you uh, get him involved in sexual activity, then the idea of God will evaporate from his mind. Well, that's that's exactly what happened in the United States uh, during the period that I'm talking about, during the period of the sexual revolution. That's what happened to the Catholics in the United States. They started acting on their sexual impulses, and the idea of God evaporated from their minds. That was the great triumph. That was the, the, the secret here. Of this really, of this uh, the really vicious nature of uh, this social engineering. Nothing can wreck you faster than uh, sexual license. Nothing can screw up your life faster and more permanently than sexual liberation. And they know that, and that's why they promote it, and that's why they're promoting it to this day. One thing you said in Libido Dominandi, which is true for me, is that you said you cannot masturbate and pray at the same time. It is very hard. Uh, for me, there's no way I can go to the club, chase after girls, and then come home at night and pray by the bed that I'm trying to bring them back to. Right. So is this? So why is that? Why is it that it's so hard to establish communion with God when you're actively rebelling? Well, because you're rebelling. I mean, by the way, that is directly from a quote, directly from Wilhelm Reich's book, The Mass Psychology of Fascism. So that shows you, uh, just to show where that comes from. Uh, why, why is that? Uh, first of all, because your, your passions are aroused. Your passions are shouting at you. You can't sit still because of your passions. You're there, And because the second part of it is that you're in rebellion. So it's not just that you're doing something and it's causing you to be agitated. You're consciously doing something that you know is wrong. And once you're consciously doing something that is wrong, well, why is it wrong? Well, because you know that there's a, a higher power out there that has set these rules and you're in rebellion against those rules. You know that. This is, this is the, the, the issue of adolescence is always a kind of self-consciousness. Like, hey, I, I'm, I am who I am. Why should I listen to what my parents told me? OK, and it, there's a sense in which we have to go through this because you have to become your own man at a certain point. But the, the devil, if you want to put it in those terms, knows this, too. And so the point is to get these people at this moment of adolescence and fixate them into a state of permanent rebellion through the manipulation of their sexuality. That's the world we live in. When I was... <clears throat> Younger, the things that I would see as a good, a beautiful girl, a girl wearing a sexy outfit. Now, because my orientation has changed, because I was trying to extract, I was trying to take pleasure and goods and fame and status from from the world. And as that has now toned toned down, I go out there and I see that same girl in the same outfit in a different way. I no longer see her as someone that I should go after and crave. Instead, I want to keep away because I know that her display now is not just for me, but it's for every other man to validate them. So have you so how can it be that 
uh, in one year, I can see this as a truth, as a good. But then once the orientation changes, once you are no longer a slave to your lust, suddenly everything you thought was good was not true. And then, uh, or, and then you wonder, how could I have seen that as true? So, I mean, how much can we trust the judgments that we make when we are actively trying to extract? Look, uh, you didn't get into this mess overnight, and you're not going to get out overnight. So consider it something like uh, alcoholism. This already happened. There's a sexaholics anonymous. I don't know how effective it is, but they've already talked about it in terms of, uh, you know, overcoming an addiction. Okay. The, 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 the point here is that uh, you did have, you weren't recognizing something that was good. It is good. The sexual attraction is a good thing, okay? But you have to bring it into line with reason. And reason says that you are there to find someone to marry, to, to get together. Because if, if you didn't have attraction, we'd never get married. If we never got married, the human race would die out. So you're in a situation where you acted on it outside of reason, and that will have an effect on you. And that will have an effect on your, on your ability to think and your mind. And it will take time to get over that. I think it will take time to get over that. But I think it's possible. Uh, and so maybe you should think about your judgments. Maybe, 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 you're, maybe you're not quite thinking properly. Maybe you're, maybe you're still thinking like a drunk, even though you hadn't, haven't had a drink. You know, that's possible. And, and 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 I've I've dealt with this I've dealt with this before with uh, I I did a uh, a guy I was working with uh, he's become he's going to become the big Catholic evangelist you know his big crusader and then suddenly his past catches up with him and it turns out he was a flaming homosexual for his entire adult life up to that point and now he wants to be the flaming Catholic uh, evangelist and apologist. And he thinks he can do it. And I'm saying, no, you can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, to use the classical description, okay, the wound, it, it, the sin is like the arrow. Okay, you've been hit by an arrow. Okay, you go to the doctor, he takes the arrow out. So that's the, you know, you go to confession, the sin is forgiven, but you still have a wound. You're still wounded from what you did. And I tried to explain to this guy, you're wounded. You have a fun. First of all, first of all, homosexuality is much worse than heterosexuality. It's much worse, and we don't seem to think we don't understand that because we watch television, and the homosexual couples are always the most well-adjusted people in the world. They never fight, and so on and so forth. But it's much worse. It's much worse because it's against nature. Okay, so it's going to take you much longer to recover. From this, and you should not be presenting yourself as some type of holier than thou crusader because it's not going to work. And it's not working because if you look at what you're doing, you still have not overcome that fundamental narcissism, which is the essence of homosexuality. And you still got it whether you're having sex or not. You're still at not apprehending reality. You know what I mean? So he completely ignored me, blew me off. You can read this. I wrote the book about it. it's called The Man Behind the Curtain, where I go into detail about how you need to recover. This is why they called for a period of penance so that your mind could recover, because you're not going to you're not if you're a drunk uh, for 20 years, you're not going to get just get sober overnight. You have to adjust. You have to learn things that you didn't learn during the 20 years when you were drunk. And that's the same thing I, I'm saying with uh, sexuality and especially homosexuality, which is a real uh, derangement of, 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 uh, of the human spirit. Now, they seem to be pushing, pu pushing homosexuality everywhere. I think for me, the turning point was when they lit up the White House in the gay colors. I think this was in uh, 2015 or so. And they, I'm, I'm trying to think, what is the bottom of this? They keep pushing it. Now they're pushing the transsexual agenda where they're modifying the biology of children by injecting them with hormones, subjecting them to various surgeries. So what is the bottom in the sense of how much further are they going to go? Because it seems like they're not satisfied 
with homosexuality alone. They're impacting the children and they're trying to create a new species of man that is neither woman or man. Where do you right. think this that's, is going? That's a war on essence. It's a war on being. It's a war on, on anyone who says that there is a nature. There, there is a logos to reality. The book I'm writing now is about logos. It's order. It's rationality. It mirrors the rationality of the mind of God. Everything in the universe has an order. The human body has an order. And what morality is, is basically a recognition of the order of the universe. It's called practical reason because of that. Okay. Now, when you have someone who comes along and says, oh, you can be free. You can do whatever you want. You can remove yourself from that order. Well, that means that you have nothing to stand on when, if you want to object to the people who gave you that freedom. This is why the oligarchs are pursuing this, this trend of thought. They will not stop. They will not stop until every single human being is their total slave and does exactly what they want with no objection. And they will try to destroy everything within their, uh, that, that, uh, that, that stops them all along the way. So the example in Indiana was the, the legislators pr uh, pr uh, passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, okay, to protect people, the people of Indiana from this juggernaut that's crushing them. And immediately the, the, the CEOs uh, parachute into South Bend, Indian, uh, I'm sorry, Indianapolis and tell them, you got to change your law. Well, let's, let's learn a lesson here. The point here is that these people, the rich, the powerful, the people who control our culture, the people who are promoting homosexuality, now saw state legislatures as an obstacle to their total dominion over, over everyone else. That was the lesson from that. The lesson of our gay mayor is that basically he's quitting South Bend being mayor because he can't get elected any place in Indiana. He's a total illusion. He's a total narcissistic fantasy that can only exist in the rarefied atmosphere of national media. And that's where he's be, uh, existing. And that's, uh, that is his purpose is basically to, to promote this idea uh, as a form of liberation and befuddle people, to get them more and more enslaved. But, but to do that just politically, you have to bypass all the rest of Indiana. You cannot get elected anywhere because the people who understand are repulsed by what you are. But even if they and if they don't understand it, you can't get elected one way or the other. Now, it's a great thing that we are here right now having this con conversation and people are watching. But at the end of the day, we may be a drop in the bucket in the amount of people who see the truth of what is going on. Do you think the oligarchs will win in turning us into slaves? No, I think there's going to be a happy ending here. I'm a Christian. I believe that history was, God is the Lord of history and God cannot bring about a bad ending. We know that there's going to be a happy ending here one way or the other. And I don't care. I mean, just my own personal experience here is suddenly I'm getting a lot of people all over the world who are waking up to the fact. The point here is it's consciousness. Once you understand that sexual liberation is a form of political control, you cannot go back. You cannot not know that anymore. And suddenly you view the world as completely different and the world is a different place because now we know that. That idea is out in the open and that idea alone will eventually destroy this project of social engineering. Now, they, they are trying really hard to keep ideas that we are sharing from reaching the mainstream. I believe a figure such as Jordan Peterson was elevated to such heights to keep a man like you specifically down to uh, try to block your ideas from rising up. So they allow this non-offensive, somewhat anti-establishment man to achieve worldwide fame. Do you think that the efforts of say Silicon Valley and the media to keep the ideas that we're sharing down is going to work? Because right now it, it looks bad. It looks bad that they're trying, they are 
uh, censoring many people on YouTube, Twitter, PayPal is banning a lot of people. They've banned me. Amazon has banned my book. So on the service, it looks like they're doing well. So how can we turn this around or what, what are you doing to get the message out there? I'm talking to you. I mean, they haven't presented that yet. That, I, I just lost my Wikipedia page. Thank you for taking down my Wikipedia page. It was nothing but SPLC propaganda used against me. I should have taken it down years ago. You know, I got one one comment on my Facebook page. I, I, I decided to look into you, but then I read your Wikipedia page and I realized you're a jerk. So uh, thank you for taking down my Wikipedia page. This is not, these are uh, all instruments that came into existence to enable the spread of an idea. The main thing is the idea, not, not the instrument. You know, the main thing is the idea. The main thing is consciousness. You cannot do anything unless you're conscious of the situation. You can, you have to understand the situation because you, before you can act effectively. So the main, the main issue is, is consciousness going to spread? And I'm saying, yeah, it is spreading. I'm talking, I'm telling you from, 40 years of experience of beating my head against the wall, banging my head against the wall. When you start out starting a magazine, you know, after I got fired as a professor and your magazine is a list of a couple thousand people that you send out a piece of paper to every month. That those that, that, that I, I was, I was fired as a professor and I thought this was a terrible thing that it's the best thing that ever happened to me because it allowed me to be free to say what I wanted. And then I built up this magazine and then that went, I mean, it still exists, but it's not what it was. And, and that goes down and suddenly I have access to more and more people. It's just been spreading. Uh, and it's not something I did or could have done myself. So you're not alone here. You are on a river, and this river is called divine providence. And God has a plan, and you have a role to play. And you can deny, uh, you can say no, or you can say yes. But that's not going to stop the river, you know. God knows it, it, from all eternity that you said yes at a particular moment, or you said no at a particular moment, and that river kept right on flowing. And you either played a part in, in bringing about the good, or you played a part in bringing about your own shame and condemnation. But that river is is not going to stop. And that river is divine providence. Right now, there are a lot of men who are called black-pilled. They have this hopelessness that this things are getting worse and worse. The evil is growing. And they're kind of at a loss on what, on what to do. They feel like they have no options. In some ways, they don't want to continue. Uh, what, kind of, what advice could, could you give these men who are hopeless? First, first advice, do not pick up a gun, okay? Do not pick up a gun and go to the nearest synagogue, okay? This is what we're seeing. I'm now being blamed for the synagogue shooting in California by uh, Dr. Michael Brown, who was claiming that because I quote scripture, I empowered this guy to go out and shoot somebody. Uh, that is not what I'm saying, okay? The first, I've been, I don't know how many times I've said it, but the whole point of the Catholic teaching on the Jews is, no one has a right to harm the Jew, okay? I am saying that the ADL is responsible for these shootings because you put a guy like this in a situation, he feels threatened. He's got a, he's got a fragile type of ego. He's 19 years old. Everyone who is 19 years old has a fragile ego. The only way you don't have a fragile ego is by growing up, getting married, and having children. And then you suddenly realize, you're, uh, I am part of the whole situation. So he's got a fragile ego. He, he thinks he's white. That's also a mistake, okay? The biggest triumph of the, the, the social engineers was to convince Catholic ethnics that they're white. You know, they're, you're not, that's a pseudo identity. He thinks he's a Christian. He doesn't, under, so he, he draws on the Christian tradition where they talk about Jews, 1 Thessalonians 2, the Jews are the enemies of, uh, they're, they're the people that killed Christ and they're enemies of the entire human race. That's not anti-Semitism. That's the truth. That's the God's honest truth. And I have to believe it because I'm a Christian. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but it's not anti-Semitism. Okay? But if you are in a situation where 
you've got this dual identity of I'm a white guy and I'm being pushed to the wall. I can't take it anymore. This I don't see any way out of this. You take that and you put it together in some type of weird way, and then you go out and shoot somebody. That that that's the problem. So don't so don't succumb to this hopelessness. Okay, they want you to do that. And many I think these there are a certain group of people that like the fact that people go out and shoot people because it allows them to take more and more control over the society. Speaking of the Jews, do you see a parallel between the bol the Bolshevik Jews that started the Russian revolution with the secular New York City Jews that are right now pushing this homosexuality everywhere, transgendered kids trying to attack you for even quoting a Christian verse in the New right. Testament. It seems like I see, uh, it seems like their nature between those two are the same. Because for people who don't know, uh, in Russia, they essentially banned churches you know millions died so are they trying to do the same thing to the united states that they did to russia yes i mean things are always the same and they're always changing so uh, the i wrote a book called the jewish revolutionary spirit in which i tried to come to some type of common denominator for two thousand years of jewish agitation or revolutionary activity and the, the 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 gist of it is the revolutionary spirit which is a rebellion against logos which began when they crucified christ and goes up to the present day what is what is this gay marriage it's a rebellion against the order ordained by god of male and female coming together and producing offspring who is behind gay marriage the jews did i say that yeah when i say that i'm called an anti-semite Amy Dean, a Jewish lady, brags about it in Tikkun magazine, and nobody objects. Joe Biden said it, praising the Jews. But it's the fact that the, they were behind, they are behind gay marriage, and gay marriage is an assault on the culture. So between Bolshevism and the sexual revolution in the United States, the crucial link is Wilhelm Reich. It's Wilhelm Reich. There's no question about it. And I think I can make the links all the way back to the time of the cross. Now that alone now, like people like Dr. Michael Brown will say, you're an anti-Semite simply because you choose the term the Jews. You can't even describe them as a group without being called an anti-Semite. Well, except when he does it, because he does it all the time. He has a video out about how Jews are smart. So suddenly it's okay to talk about the Jews if you're praising them. But as soon as you hold them responsible for something uh, that they don't like, then they call you an anti-Semite. This double standard, this irrationality has got to stop. Because if they keep going down the road they're going down, they're going to create more and more people like Mr. Ernest in California. Because he feels no one's listening to me. Nobody cares about me. I I, I can't take it anymore. I'll show them. I'm going to take a gun. Read his manifesto. He's not, he's not a stupid guy. Read his manifesto. And then you'll see why I say that the ADL is responsible for these shootings. So I know we are running out of time. I just wanted to ask you one more, one more thing for men like me who have not been close to God during their fornication days. Uh, but now understand that we are definitely in some kind of spiritual war. What advice do you have for them? How can men like me start to begin our journey of faith? Go to the local Catholic church and say you want to be baptized. Or if you've already been baptized, say you want to join, because this is the instrument that God created to help you to lead a successful life. It's that simple. It's that simple. There is a way out. There is a solution to this problem, and you can find it through that institution. It's that simple. Okay, great. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for taking the time. I am going to get your book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit, and read that, and I hope you can come on to talk to me again in the future. For everyone who is watching, I highly recommend you buy his book, Libido Dominandi. Go to his website, culturewars.com. So thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Peace. Salam.